It's been said that history has a way of repeating itself. The global refugee crisis of more than 65 million displaced people draws a correlation to one of the darkest times in human history. Today, the world is experiencing the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. As some nations open their borders to refugees escaping conflicts in their homelands, closer to home, we remember our past, when nearly a thousand refugees from Europe arrived in Oswego, New York in 1944. The Holocaust refugees were brought to the U.S. as guests of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. They were a token group intended to be part of a larger plan to bring possibly hundreds of thousands of Holocaust victims to what was called safe havens around the country. That first group, more than 900 people interned at the Fort Ontario Army Camp, was also the last group offered a safe haven. That story was documented 30 years ago in a Peabody award-winning WXXI production called Safe Haven. Tonight, we celebrate the, the anniversary of that film at a relevant time in modern history. Paul Lewis is the writer and producer of the 1987 documentary. He joins us to talk about the backstory of Safe Haven and what went into making this film. And Paul Lewis, welcome to the program. Thank I you. understand a public affairs program. This was your desk many, many years ago, so it's great to have you here. And I'm sure to be on the other side. It's great to be back <laughs> in WXXI. Great to be back in Rochester. Right. Well, thank you. First, I have to ask you, how and when did you come across the story of Safe Haven? And I have to ask if you were surprised to learn that this pivotal part of history was, what, less than 100 miles away from Rochester? Yes, I came to WXXI in 1985 as a young television producer. My job was to produce documentaries here uh, in Rochester that would perhaps be broadcast throughout the state of New York. About a year after I arrived, someone said to me, what do you know about the concentration camp that was up in Oswego? I said, what are you talking about? That makes no sense to me. I hadn't heard anything about anything like that. And it kind of just went by the wayside. I asked a couple of people, is there a concentrate? What is that? I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. Finally, I ran into someone who said, well, it wasn't a concentration camp, it was an internment camp for European refugees from the war, from the Holocaust. It was one small effort. So, okay, now I start to get intrigued. Right. And my natural curiosity takes over <laughs> and I start to do a little bit of research. Um, and it was hard to do that research. First of all, there was no such thing as the internet back then. Uh, <laughs> so it was really uh, shoe leather research. <laughs> Tried to find out what, was talk what people were talking about. What is this uh, internment camp? It didn't make any sense. Finally, I figured out what it was, uh, that 982 were brought over, I heard. Who were they, what were they, I didn't really know. Um, so I pitched this to uh, the, the executives here at WXXI at the time, and they said, they didn't know anything about it. I finally went down to Washington, D.C., to the National Archives to look and start to do some more research. And that's when I found 50 seconds, 5-0, in less than a minute, 50 seconds of film of the day they arrived in Oswego. At that point, I said, I don't know how I'll fill up the rest of the hour, but I've got at least one minute, right? So I knew that I could do this story. And it, it turned out to be an amazing story, a small slice of American history that most people don't know, a, a piece of Jewish history that people just don't know, even people like myself, who I thought had a pretty good Jewish history background and political science and American history background, I knew nothing about it. Most people didn't and, frankly, still don't. After that digging and that research and the time that you put into it, at what point did you realize, you know what, there is an angle to this story that people really do not understand, something that had not been discussed uh, before and, and the story, period. Well, frankly, the entire story yeah. was, was unknown. Very, very few people knew about this. It was not front and center when it happened in 1944, uh, even in Oswego. And I show this in the film. You'll see this when you watch the when you watch the film. In Oswego, the day they arrived, the newspaper that day, the coverage was on page 12. It wasn't even front page coverage in Oswego. So you can imagine that the rest of the country, it was certainly buried if told at all. There were occasional moments where it was front and center. There was a big national radio program. There was a little bit of coverage in some of the national news magazines. Some of the national papers had something about it. But it was not front and center because it was right after the Normandy invasion and everybody's attention was there. 
How will uh, the Allied forces go? Will they be successful in ending the war? Everybody was focused on that. Nobody was focused on a small group of nearly a thousand who had come to our shores. So a small group of nearly a thousand. You mentioned there was no Google. So how did you, A, go about tracking down some of the survivors? And then when you did and you made that connection, were they open to, because you're asking them to relive a, a a difficult, horrific part of their lives. Right. Were they open to sharing that with you? Okay, so first, how do I track them down? That was old-fashioned shoe leather reporting as well. Mm -hmm. There had been some things written about this, including a book by Ruth Gruber, who was an assistant to Under Secretary of State uh, Harold Ickes at the time. Her job was to go over and bring these refugees back to the United States. She wrote a book called Haven that had been published, that had some names in it, so there were enough pieces for me to start going and trying to track people down. And then I came to find out that they had periodic reunions. Every five years or so, many of the refugees who would come and yeah. ended up staying in this country uh, would get together and recall, renew old friendships, and whatever. So uh, I went to one of the reunions in 1985 or 86. Um, I was able to track down, and one person led to another person who led to another person. Um, I wanted to tell the story that I, taught, I learned in journalism school. You tell the big story small. This is a big story of 982. We need to tell it through a few voices. Uh, there are six really main characters throughout, um, all who represent a different side of the story, um, including one woman who was married there, who gave birth there. It was really an interesting uh, little taste of it. Somebody else who was somewhat official was the camp translator for the camp director. So all of these stories, one led to another, led to another. It's, that's just old-fashioned reporting. How did they react when I came to them? Some wanted to talk, some didn't. For some, reliving that entire era is so painful. And what happened to them and their families in the Holocaust is so difficult to relive that some did not want to talk about it. Others did. Yeah. Others wanted to tell me about their 18 months here in uh, Fort Ontario. Well, Paul, you mentioned the reunions that you attended uh, back in, in 88 or 86, rather. I came across a quote from a gentleman who attended the 55th reunion. Uh, his name was Andre Waxman, and he said, Oswego was a fairy tale, Oswego was a scandal. He said the residents of Oswego were incredibly gracious and welcoming based on his experiences, but he believed that the U.S. turned its back during the Holocaust, and so much more could have been done. He said possibly hundreds of thousands could have been saved, as you discussed in the film. Was it, you had the facts, you had the material uh, referencing that the U.S. could have done more. Was it important for you to, to try to find a voice affiliated with the U.S. government to say, yes, more could have been done? Listen, historians have now, when I did the film 30 years ago, it was 40 years after the events. And so that's enough time for history and historians to have a look at it. And so one of the prominent uh, uh, people in the film is uh, a professor, David Wyman, from the University of Massachusetts. He's a fascinating guy, the son of a Protestant minister who has made his life's work Holocaust uh, scholarship. And he found that the United States government made it very difficult to bring in any refugees at the time, that the United States did not even fulfill the quotas that existed never mind expanding the quotas to bring in refugees. The U.S. government did not even adhere to its own laws and policies at the time. So it was quite astounding for me, having grown up in a family that revered FDR, to learn that FDR really did not do much to help the Jews of Europe. Okay, it was so counter to everything that I grew up knowing and feeling. Uh, but the fact is that FDR knew what was going on. There's no question about that. There are some people who say, well, the United States, nobody in this country knew of the atrocities going on in Europe. That's just not true. We can demonstrate that. We see that through the historical documents. And then he made choices. And listen, historians have been harsh in their criticism of FDR, and this film is too. Uh, FDR made a choice to do nothing. Now, he would have said at the time he needed to keep his eye on prosecuting the war. And so any diversion from that would have been uh, a, a, a time uh, drain and an energy drain, mm -hmm. and he needed to keep his eye focused on uh, beating the Germans in the war. Well, Paul, it is great to have you here. Thank you for this. And after the film, Paul will be joining, will be joined rather by two Holocaust survivors, including a former resident from the Safe Haven Refugee Camp. Be sure to stay with us to hear their personal stories and firsthand accounts. Now, the special 30th anniversary screening of the Peabody Award-winning WXXI documentary, Safe Haven.
This program is funded in part by the public television stations of New York State, with additional funding from the Jewish Community Foundation of Rochester, New York, and the Newman Fund of the National Foundation for Jewish Culture. We were literally a token group designed to induce others to do the major portion of rescue and sheltering. The moment I saw the statue, I knew my life had changed. I knew I was becoming a mensch. I was becoming a human being, a person again. Why? Why us? What have we, we are the victims of the Nazis. Why should they put us on the barbed wire? I think we should be grateful for every human being that was safe. But in doing so, we should remember how many more could have been safe. Hello, I'm Robert Clary. You may know me as an actor from the stage or from television where I played Corporal Louis Laveau on Hogan's Heroes. I am also a survivor of the Jewish Holocaust. I was deported from Paris when I was 16 and a half years old and somehow managed to live through five concentration camps until I was liberated from Buchenwald. While so many millions were being exterminated, the nations of the world closed their hearts and their borders to those who wanted to find refuge from Nazi terror. Finally, in 1944, Nearly a thousand refugees were brought to the United States as guests of President Franklin Roosevelt. They were interned here in what used to be an army camp in Oswego, upstate New York. This was the only refugee shelter in the United States and the only effort made by the U.S. government to rescue any of Hitler's victims. This is a story of a token 1,000 who found a safe haven in America. August 5, 1944, 982 European refugees arrived by train in the small town of Oswego. They are weary from the overnight train ride, a two-week ocean voyage, and years of being deprived of running and hiding. Well, I can't believe I'm here again. It's, uh, it's quite an experience to retrace your steps and to come back to a place where you were 40, over 40 years ago. You're standing probably on the spot where one of the administration barracks stood. The kitchens were lined up this way, the entrances facing over there and there were a series of barracks going around there facing this way with the entrances. They did not know when they arrived that they would be interned here for the next 18 months, and they did not know about the political scandal that nearly resulted from the efforts to bring them to freedom. By 1944, the Nazis had already killed four million Jews. Those who did manage to escape, like the 930 on board the ship, the St. Louis in 1939, were turned away from every port at which they stopped. No country would accept refugees, certainly not Jewish refugees, and no country made any attempt to rescue those caught in Hitler's grasp. There's no question that the government, that, that the officials in Washington knew that genocide was happening really by August 1942. Professor David Wyman, author of The Abandonment of the Jews, disputes any claim that the American people just did not know what was happening in Europe. As far as Roosevelt is concerned, we know because we have the minutes of a meeting that he held with Jewish leaders on December 8th, 1942. We know from what he said at that meeting that he was definitely aware that the Jews of Europe were being systematically annihilated. 
Roosevelt knew what was happening, but he chose to do nothing about it. Rescuing Jews from Hitler just was not a priority for him. There were several reasons for that. Roosevelt didn't want anything to interfere with the war effort, and Congress and labor unions were strongly opposed to any increased immigration. But Professor Wyman, a Protestant and grandson of two Methodist ministers, says the main reason no action was taken was anti-Semitism, which he says was rampant in the country and in the State Department. We have official documents in the State Department that refer to the possibility of 50,000 Jews coming out as a problem and a difficulty, and that this is something that we, would, we don't want to have happen. These people in the State Department didn't give a damn about Jews. They weren't the heroic types who would have fought for anything. They weren't that type, and they, and they received absolutely no leadership from President Roosevelt on it. He was no friend of the Jewish people. He could have saved hundreds and thousands of Jews with a few words, simply by saying a few words, but he didn't. Not only did the U.S. government refuse to raise the limited quotas, but 90% of the available immigration visas were never issued. More than 200,000 lives could have been saved if only the State Department had operated within the existing law. The State Department managed to hold the use of the quotas to 10% while they knew that those people who didn't get out were going to die. Here's the application form that they devised in the middle of the Holocaust. Four feet two sides, eight feet, small type, red tape, an immensely complicated form. And when you analyze it, it becomes clear that what it was put into operation for was to make it hard for refugees to come in here. The information about Nazi atrocities was coming to the State Department by cable from authoritative sources in Switzerland, including the U.S. ambassador. In an effort to conceal the reports, State Department officials wire Switzerland saying, don't send any more cables about the extermination of the Jews. The State Department cover-up lasted 14 months. Then, in December 1943, some Treasury Department lawyers uncovered the cables from Switzerland. And even more shocking, they also found the State Department's instructions to suppress the information. These lawyers in the Treasury put together a memorandum. The title of it was, and it was a, an accurate title, Acquiescence of This Government in the Murder of the Jews. The memorandum concluded that State Department officials, quote, have not only failed to use the governmental machinery at their disposal to rescue Jews from Hitler, but have even gone so far as to use this governmental machinery to prevent the rescue of Jews, unquote. The lawyers presented that memorandum to Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau and demanded that he take it to President Roosevelt. And they said, Mr. Secretary, you must go to the President. You must insist that he take action. And you must warn him that what we've learned about the State Department cannot be kept in. It's going to have to break. And when it does, there's going to be a nasty scandal that's going to tarnish the whole Roosevelt administration. Six days after he saw the memorandum, President Roosevelt created the War Refugee Board, which would eventually bring the 1,000 refugees to Oswego. Meanwhile, Samuel Grafton, a columnist for the old New York Post, suggested in April 1944 that the United States open free ports for people, similar to commercial free ports for materials and manufactured goods. Quoting from my column, obviously, we need a place where we can put refugees down without making final decisions about them. Of course, I'm a little ashamed to find myself pandering to anti-refugee prejudices, even to the extent of saying, yes, pile the legal disabilities on them, give them no rights, store them like corn, herd them like cattle. But the need is so sharp, the time is so short, <coughs> our current example to the world is so bad that it's necessary to settle for whatever can be done. The War Refugee Board was already working on a similar plan. Instead of a free port, they called it an emergency refugee shelter. The board wanted the United States to open shelters to any refugee who could flee Nazi Europe. They hoped that a sweeping U.S. offer would induce other countries to accept refugees also. But FDR refused to completely open the borders. 
He did agree to admit 500 or 1,000 as a token gesture of rescue, only for the duration of the war. So the idea was that you would move Professor Sharon Lowenstein wrote a doctoral thesis on the Oswego story, entitled Token Refuge. Oswego really represents the failure of that larger effort. It's a, uh, it's a token, it's a group of 1,000, a token that Roosevelt uh, permitted in, in lieu of this much larger scheme to establish uh, camps all over the country and bring in tens and hundreds of thousands. In June 1944, refugees from all over Europe descended upon liberated southern Italy, clogging the roads and draining the army's rations. This provided Roosevelt a reason or excuse to bring out this token shipment. 1,000 refugees would be selected and brought to Oswego outside the normal immigration quarters. Don't forget, this was 44. Ruth Gruber, who later wrote enough. about the Oswego experience in her book, Haven, was then an assistant to Interior Secretary Harold Eckes. Because she was Jewish and spoke German and Yiddish, Eckes sent Gruber to Italy to escort the refugees to safety in America. While America was selecting that thousand, Adolf Eichmann in Hungary had begun the selection in April 1944, late April. Now it was July 1944, and he had already selected 550,000 Jews to be burned in Auschwitz. And America was selecting 1,000 for life in our country. 3,000 refugees applied for the 1,000 spaces. One of the people who helped make the selections was Max Willman. Well, I wrote to uh, my wife several times telling her that you're pl playing God and I don't like the role. More than 100 who had survived or escaped Dachau and Buchenwald were chosen first. Then the very young and very old. Families were kept together. 982 refugees from 18 countries that had been ravaged by Hitler boarded the troop ship Henry Gibbons. Many were in rags. Many had no shoes at all. They had newspapers around their feet. The children, of course, almost none had shoes. They had the look of refugee terror. They had almost no belongings. They had been running, some of them, for six years, and they looked it. We were all emaciated, torn clothing. Uh, we looked like we had been through a hell of some sort. But at that point, we were free, and that was the essential ingredient. Before boarding the ship, the refugees all signed a form, indicating they understood the conditions of the US offer to bring them to a safe haven in America. The first condition was, I shall remain as a guest of the United States until the end of the war, then I must return to my homeland. You signed that? Yes. I would do anything to go to America. I would sign it again and again and again and again because I didn't care at that particular moment what happens to me later. Right now, I want to be going to America. I want to go and I want to be there even if it is for one hour, for one day, for one week. I wanted to leave Europe. We would have signed almost anything. And some of us couldn't believe that the United States would stick to that. We felt it must be some sort of pro forma statement that we were signing. I knew that as soon as I got back to Washington, I would have to report to Ickes and through him to Roosevelt. And I said to the people, you have to tell me what you've been through. And some of the men said, we can't tell you. You're a woman. What they did to us was so obscene. I said, forget if you can that I'm a woman. So they talked, and day after day, we paced the deck, and they told me stories of courage and terror. The SS man says, look, if you don't go in the next inn, I will shoot you. We went to that inn, and it was chock full, and uh, they wouldn't take us. And she says, OK, now I will shoot you and your children. And she looked him straight in the eye like, says, OK, shoot me. She dared him. I mean, it was mad, you know, it was mad. And he got, he didn't do it. We knew what happened and what happens to Jews. We knew about 
the crematoria, we knew about the ovens, we knew about Auschwitz and Dachau and Auschwitz and, and uh, some of the assorted other camps. That's what we were running from. There are no words in the dictionary, there are no words in the human mind to give back that fear. You're sentenced to death and you know any minute that they're going to catch you to die. They're going to take you and kill you. We were totally alone, my mother and I. We had uh, no more ha uh, home, not in Italy, not in Germany. We had nothing in front and nothing behind. Of the 982 refugees on board, 874 were Jews, 73 were Catholic, 28 were Greek and Russian Orthodox, and seven were Protestant. Yugoslavs made up the largest national group, then Austrians, Poles, and Germans. They sailed to America along with a thousand wounded GIs from the battles of Anzio and Casino. The close quarters created tension among the different national groups, and it almost boiled over. The Yugoslavs didn't like the Germans, the Germans didn't like the Poles, and the Poles didn't like the Russians. All this despite the fact that all of them were victims of the Nazis. One of our Yugoslav leaders was sitting um, talking to another man when a Polish child ran and bumped into him and he yelled out Polako, which in Yugoslav means go slowly. But to the Poles, it sounded like Polak. And that was a, a very, you know, almost proprium. So there was a big fight and we had to separate the men. While still in the Mediterranean Sea, the Henry Gibbons had two close calls with the Nazi war machine. One time submarines, the other time German bombers flew overhead. They threw some uh, smoke screens around uh, the boats and gas chambers and gas and smoke uh, get confused in moments of panic and people panic. You know, at least they, we didn't fall into their clutches. It's, it's better to be devoured by the sharks than to be tortured and, and burned by the Nazis. Finally, August 3rd, 1944, after two weeks on a rough sea, the Henry Gibbons approached New York Harbor and sailed past the Statue of Liberty. The moment I saw the statue, I knew my life had changed. I knew I was becoming a mensch. I was becoming a human being, a person again. And I was looking forward to that freedom with such a cherished feeling that can't be described. I was so grateful because that represented to me America. The Statue of Liberty was America, and it was the people that had just liberated me. So my prayers of thanks were very profound and very deep. How can you describe that with words? You know, that's why I write music, you know, because with words, I, I mean, if I were a poet, then I could describe it. Everybody rushed to the rails, a thousand people, and began to wave at her. And one of our rabbis asked me if he could say a prayer. And I said, of course. So we made a little space for him on that crowded deck. And he bent down and kissed it. And then he stood up and he said the prayer of survival. It's called the Shehechianu. It's a prayer that thanks the Lord for having sustained us to live to this day. And we all said it with him because we had all survived. The next day, the refugees were ferried across the Hudson River to Hoboken, New Jersey, where their clothes were disinfected and their bodies were deloused with DDT. Although they were safe in America, when husbands and wives were separated for their showers, many became terrified, because for most, separation in concentration camps meant death. All men went on one side and all the women on the other. And you, everything got... Uh, sterilized by steam, and everything shrank. So when we came out, nothing fit. At 9.30 that night, the refugees boarded special trains that would take them to their safe haven on the shores of Lake Ontario. 
For several refugees, a train ride to an uncertain location escorted by armed guards brought back horrifying memories. Manja Breuer has survived five concentration camps and narrowly escaped capture while on a train with other proper papers. In fact, it was very traumatic for me. I was scared to death in the train. In fact, I remember looking, the first thing I come in, I w wanted to see where the doors were really to run out. I wanted to be near a door. At 7.30, Saturday morning, August 5th, the train pulled up to Fort Ontario. Even though the sun was already shining, the sky was clear and the air was warm. What the refugees saw bewildered, frightened, and angered them. Surrounding their new home in the freedom of America was a six-foot-high chain-link fence stopped by three strands of barbed wire. Why? Why us? What have we, we are the victims of the Nazis. Why should they put us on the barbed wire? We, are, we couldn't put it together. I noticed that some of the older people who had spent considerable time in concentration camps were much more upset about the fence than I seem to have been. Uh, I guess to them the fence meant the concentration camp. In fact, the fence and barbed wire had been put up long before the refugees arrived. Fort Ontario was an old army garrison. The original fort had been built in 1755 and was used in the Revolutionary and Civil Wars. The barracks that would now house refugees had been home to thousands of soldiers over the years. But the history of the fort was of little interest to those seeking a safe haven. To them, the fence was an obstacle to freedom. Their protests on this score were immediate and continued all the time they were there. They Joseph Smart was a director of the emergency refugee shelter. They felt that uh, they had been uh, misled in what they were told by the uh, uh, army interviewers in, uh, in Italy. Uh, they, they were assured that they were coming to the United States as uh, honored guests. And uh, I guess nobody had told them that they would be restricted, uh, that their movements would be, uh, would be restricted. Smart had worked for the War Relocation Authority in the Japanese resettlement program. Now the War Relocation Authority was setting the policy at the Oswego shelter and Smart was called back to run it. Frankly, my, uh, I hadn't been very happy about my participation in the uh, Japanese relocation role, and I thought here is an opportunity to uh, redeem myself. Uh, of course, uh, ultimately, I found that I was running another uh, small concentration camp. The refugees disembarked. They had no passports, no papers, the only identification they had were the tags given to them by the soldiers, U.S. Army casual baggage. We had become excess baggage uh, in, 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 in a very real way. People didn't want us. We were excess. We were to be disposed of. At least that was our experience for, for several years. Sheets and towels were issued and barracks were assigned. And finally, they were served breakfast. I couldn't believe that I could get so much. You know, it, it, was, it was so overpowering, this food, the, the bread and the milk and the cereal. And I had big breakfast the first day. I remember at least seven eggs. And I took all the bananas I could eat. I would just hoard the bread something awful. I would not want to give up a crumb. People in the following days and weeks came to see us, to see what has, had arrived there in their small, peaceful town. And they were very friendly, and they wanted to see who we were and what we were. And they brought little gifts and, I think, some food. And things were exchanged over the fence. And as much as people could talk English, at the time, they talked to each other. Try to touch. Adam Moons was 17 when he arrived at Fort Ontario. He found a recreation hall with a ping pong table and paddles, but no balls. A soldier on board the Henry Gibbons had given him a shiny new Roosevelt dime. He went to the fence and asked an Oswego boy if he would buy him a ping pong ball. And a few minutes later, he came back on his bicycle and tossed a little brown bag over the fence. I picked it up, and there were three ping pong balls for a dime. And I was so elated, I, I didn't speak English terribly well, and I was so pleased 
I said to him, John, you are a big ass. And I, I could hear the hush uh, uh, suddenly falling over the group standing there, and I knew I had said the wrong thing. And he was wise enough to say, well, what did you mean, Adam? I said, well, you're a big ass. He says, what do you mean? I said, you know, during the war, the pilot that shoot down the enemy, he's a big ass too. <laughs> so he said, you mean an ace? <laughs> I've been telling that story ever since. It almost created an international incident. The news of America's only refugee shelter was mostly overlooked because of the excitement of the Normandy invasion. Even the local newspaper, the Oswego Palladium Times, placed the story of the refugees' arrival on page 12, while the front page was filled with news from the fighting in Europe. As a health precaution, the refugees were quarantined for one month. No one was allowed out and no one was allowed in to visit them. That frustrated many refugees because a third of them had close relatives living in the United States and 34 families had immediate relatives serving in the American armed forces. After years of not knowing who was alive and who was burned in a crematoria, the fence became the site of many emotional family reunions. The Jewish community from nearby Rochester, New York, immediately sent sacred Torahs to the refugees who had already set up a synagogue in the camp. Orthodox Jews from Brooklyn came up to Oswego to set up a kosher kitchen and dining hall. To be together again and to be able to uh, demonstrate openly that you're Jewish and be able to follow your religion and be able to pray uh, uh, according to your own heart, openly, uh, it definitely was uh, extremely special. All the Jewish festivals became so much more meaningful because they had escaped. They had the, the exquisite relief from bombs and terror, but at the same time, even their, their joy was bittersweet because they didn't know what was happening to their relatives in Europe. And word kept coming to us that most of them were killed. 20-year-old Manya Hartmeyer had fallen in love with Ernst Breuer while they were fleeing the Nazis. They came to Oswego together and wanted to be married. But because they had no legal status in this country, it took two weeks of pleading with Washington to get the government's approval for the wedding. Ernie and I were given permission to go to the city hall and we were allowed to get uh, our marriage license. And that day was the 17th of August, 1944. The quarantine was lifted on September 1st. Nearly 5,000 people streamed in to talk with the first Nazi victims to reach America. The visitors found simple army barracks divided into small apartments by thin walls. The refugees were given cots, chairs, and tables, but little else. For the refugees, the end of quarantine meant a limited freedom. With a pass, now they were allowed to go into the town of Oswego. But they could not leave the city limits, and they had to return within six hours. I remember the, the gate opening up and this Oklahoma land rush of people walking down the long street heading for town and then assaulting the stores. Now, I remember this was still the rationing time. And I remember people going into a grocery store and bargaining with the clerks for fruit apples, and the clerks utterly be bewildered, never having had anybody bargain with them. 193 refugee children and teenagers enrolled in Oswego's elementary, junior, and senior high schools. In the spring semester, nine students were admitted to Oswego State Teachers College. It resulted, as, as, as all good th things did at the shelter, uh, from uh, pressure from the refugees. They, they were starving for education. They demanded education. They brought so much yearning for learning. And, and other youngsters who hadn't been quite so eager began to feel, well, if they go to the library every day, I better go to the library. The old Oswego High School has been converted to condominiums. Today, Ralph Faust, 
lives in a building where he was principal for 24 years. I met them and took them through the gym and the auditorium and the classrooms. And one incident that always stuck in my mind is we came down in the lower floor where the industrial arts shops were. They were looking through the glass doors at the machinery and they were speaking German together. And I could hear over the babble of German uh, the word uh, magnific. <laughs> that, always, that always stuck in my mind. They were so eager to get started. Ralph uh, is one of those people who I think understood both emotionally and intellectually what the situation was, what the need was. He was not only a very good educator, but uh, from a social point of view, I think a very great man. At that point, I hadn't thought that I would ever go to school again. How I was a little bit been? beyond high school age. And, uh, uh, How so long had it been since you were in school? This was 1944, uh, six years. On the first day of school, Principal Faust prepared a welcoming ceremony for the refugees. I thought it would be a good idea if our school president, the president of the student council, would uh, give them a word of welcome. And uh, he objected to it. He didn't think that uh, they should be in the school without uh, the school approving of it first. He didn't think they should be in the community without the community approving of it. Tell me about the reaction of the people of Oswego. Was there any anti-Semitism that you felt at all? I personally never experienced any of that. Uh, I don't know whether it was really anti-Semitism or anti-foreigners or anti a lot of people suddenly having invaded uh, this peaceful little town. I, I don't know. I heard about it, but uh, I certainly never experienced it in any way. The refugees established an advisory council to govern the internal policies of the camp. But the ethnic divisions that were tearing Europe apart also divided the refugees. Because Fred Baum spoke several languages, he served as translator for Director Smartet for some of the refugees. He remembers the angry arguments over how many representatives each nationality group would have on the advisory council. I know that at one point, at one of those meetings, I got mad and I walked out. I said, to heck with you guys, I don't want to listen to this thing. I had to tell them this in three languages. Six weeks after the refugees arrived, Eleanor Roosevelt visited a shelter. She gave us a ray of hope. Her coming here meant that we meant something to the American public, to the American government. Otherwise, Mrs. Roosevelt, the wife of the president, would not have come to visit us. She was uh, indignant immediately uh, about the restrictions in the shelter. Uh, scolded me before she left about what the government was doing to uh, keep these uh, friendly people behind the fence. Do you think she scolded her husband later that night? I'm sure she did. She, uh, she no doubt did. And I suspect that, as uh, usual, he uh, paid no attention to her. The biggest problem inside the camp, aside from the lack of liberty, was work. The refugees were prohibited from taking jobs in town. It was very, very difficult because we were eager to start our future, a new life, and begin to live like normal people. To us, it wasn't normal that we were in a, in a military camp and not able to make a living, not able to make money again and have jobs and, and uh, start already. We were so eager to start. For the refugee children and teenagers, life at Fort Ontario was almost normal. They went to school, played baseball, swam in the lake, and learned to dance. But without jobs, their parents could do little more than sit around and dream of the day they would be free. Adding insult to their frustration, the refugees knew that Nazi POWs who were brought to the U.S. were being paid by the government to work in nearby orchards and factories, and even at Fort Ontario. Whereas we brought in 1,000 refugees, we brought in a total of 425,000 POWs, 372,000 of them German. 
Although they were not permitted to go outside the camp to work, the government expected the refugees to work inside the camp, mowing the lawns, clearing the snow, and shoveling the coal. What was needed in the camp was manual labor. These are, and you're asking this population that is not yet physically rehabilitated, a population that has never done manual labor. It's not that they didn't want to work. For the most part, this is an urban, mercantile, professional group of people. Work was a problem. There, there were certain people who would work all the time, and other people, you could stand on your head and you couldn't get them to work. Refugee doctors and pharmacists practiced their professions at the shelter hospital. The others, unable to pursue their careers, took vocational training, carpentry and auto mechanics, sewing and beauty culture. Nearly all the refugees studied English. All the materials for these classes and the teachers were supplied by the Jewish welfare agencies because the government provided only food and shelter. The agencies provided books for the camp library, textbooks for the Hebrew classes, and the mimeograph machine for the camp newspaper. They also provided paints, clay, and musical instruments for the sizable artist's community. We had magnificent artists, and we could send their paintings and their sculpture and their drawings to art exhibits in Syracuse, and they could win first prizes. The paintings could go, but not the painters. The cultural life at Fort Ontario was extensive. Among the refugees were opera stars and cabaret singers, noted musicians and painters. There was always a show being produced, a play, an opera, or a symphony concert. Leon Levitz started his musical training in Yugoslavia and continued to study music even while in the Ferramonti concentration camp. In Oswego, his playing and composing career was put on hold, but he was still in demand. Really, I felt like a big shot because uh, word got out that there was among the refugees somebody who knows how to fix pianos. So uh, sometimes they, I was smuggled out in the middle of the night. <laughs> I, uh, or sometimes I would stay after school <clears throat> and I would go to work on some of the most hideous old square grants that were so bad and any little thing that I did for them they thought was a miracle. Oh, give me land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Don't fence me in, the Cole Porter tune, became the unofficial theme song in a camp. And some of the younger refugees took the song literally. There was a hole somewhere along the fence where many of us, uh, I was, I guess, one of the first to sneak under it and take the train or the bus and go into Syracuse and from there into New York. The shelter administrators knew about these unauthorized leaves, but ignored them. During the 18 months they were interned in Oswego, not one refugee was ever in trouble with the local police and no one ever truly escaped. I don't think any of us would have challenged authorities in a, in a very serious way. Sneaking under the fence was one thing, but I think to totally disappear from the camp I can hardly imagine that anyone would have uh, undertaken that kind of thing. I think they could have had this camp without a fence and, and no one would have, uh, would have left if told not to go. Good afternoon. In Oswego, New York today, a thousand people are rejoicing over the greatest Christmas gift that could have been given them. Namely, that to save their lives, they have been admitted to the United States. On December 23rd, 1944, Famed radio personality Dorothy Thompson broadcast a 20-minute Christmas special with the Fort Ontario refugees. It had been nearly five months since they arrived, and their future remained uncertain. They are not here on immigrants' visas or conventional visitors' visas. Legally, it's dubious whether they are here at all. Though they are the, our friends, they are not enjoying American freedoms. They cannot move outside a restricted area. When hostilities cease, they must go back to Europe. Five days later, the holiday spirit was shattered. One of the refugees committed suicide. The harsh winter, the questionable future, and the guilt over having left family behind in Europe 
was too much to bear. Winters in Oswego are normally rugged, but the winter of 1944-45, with record-breaking cold and snow, was especially harsh. Our building, army barrack in which we lived, was uh, directly on the lake, and the wind would howl in from Canada, snow would pile up, and by some uh, sadistic design, the shower room faced the lake. It seems that it was almost a year, like nine months winter. It was cold and icy. And I was looking forward. I was kept on saying, with God's help, I will go to a climate where we'll never see a winter again. On February 19th, another tragedy occurred. One of the refugees was killed when the coal pile he was working on shifted and crushed him. He left a wife and four young children. The severe winter, suicide and coal accident plunged the camp into a mass depression. Government psychologists recommended that the refugees be allowed to leave the camp for a period of a week or two to visit family or friends throughout the country. But all such proposals were turned down by Washington. And so the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months. Let us take the example of a small little bird which you take and put in a nice and comfortable cage. You take well care of the bird, you give him his daily food, you give him some sugar from time to time. Then after a few weeks, when he's well acquainted to the room he's in, you close the window and let him spread his wings between the four walls. You will be surprised... Adam Moons won first prize among the teenagers for this composition in a camp newspaper. The topic? Since six months, I am in America. You will be surprised when a few years later your little bird will die. He will die because he's thirsty, thirsty for liberty he cannot enjoy. So is every single being in the world. I think, as you can see from the tenure of the article, this preoccupation with freedom, with being walled in, with being fenced in. Lydia and Victor Franco were the first to have a baby at Fort Ontario. 22 other babies would be born at the camp and each one created a legal dilemma for the government and the refugees. You could have a baby on a freighter in the South China Sea. If the freighter had an American flag on, that baby was an American citizen because it was American soil. But if you had a baby born here in the big white hospital that we had then on these grounds, the lawyers in Washington couldn't decide if the baby was an American or not. To me, that was absolutely absurd. I said, this isn't this American soil. Pardonnez-moi, is it, is it France, is it China? Mania Breuer gave birth to a baby girl in the camp. She gave her an American name, Diane. It's America. So what is the problem? She was born here on the soil. She is an American. What is the government trying to do? What the government was trying to do was send the refugees back to Europe at the end of the war. If the babies were granted citizenship, the government would have to face the possibility of deporting its own people. Freedom Germany will not mean the end of the war. Franklin Delano Japan. Roosevelt died April 12, 1945. For Fort Ontario mourned along with the nation. The Everything became dark again. We had so much faith in his leadership and in his human humanity and in his capacity ability to, to really uh, make the world better, that having lost him, we thought that all our hopes were dashed. Finally, the Nazi war machine crumbled. The Russians took Berlin, the Italian partisans captured and killed Mussolini, Hitler committed suicide and Germany surrendered. Victory in Europe brought joy to the refugees, but also fear. Fear again, because that, of course, signaled our having to return. Uh, the, the pact, so to speak, was that at war's end, we would be shipped back. Now the war was ending, or ended, and that meant that very soon thereafter, we would have to once again pack our belongings and, and return. The refugees could not bear to think about returning to their so-called homelands 
Their homelands that had persecuted and expelled them. Their homelands where six million Jews had been slaughtered. But with the war over in Europe, the War Relocation Authority, which ran the camp, was slated to go out of business June 30th. President Truman indicated he would keep faith with a deal made by FDR. Oswego's leading citizens drafted a memorial to the president and Congress, pleading that the refugees be allowed to stay. But their pleas were ignored, and the refugees were one step closer to deportation. In May, Joe Smart shocked Washington by resigning as shelter director to work for the refugees' freedom. He formed a citizens' committee called Friends of Fort Ontario Guest Refugees. Number one, we set out to create public opinion. To, we, we, we wanted to exert as rapidly as we could a great public pressure on the administration. Don't send these people back or you'll be in trouble with the, with the public. Uh, do treat them with, uh, with compassion and find a solution that doesn't require to be sent them back. Smart won the support of a hundred prominent citizens, politicians, lawyers and educators, from Albert Einstein to Eleanor Roosevelt. He lobbied hard in Washington to gain sympathy for the refugees. Meanwhile, the House Committee on Immigration scheduled hearings in Oswego. For two days in June, the refugees were filled with hope. These hearings, they felt, surely would be the key that unlocked the door into the United States. I remember uh, questioning me about uh, why my father was in danger of being arrested and deported. And he had one line. Was he a communist? Was he, uh, uh, had he done something illegal? And each question that he asked me along those lines, all I said to him was no, because he was a Jew. Well, why did he have to hide? Because he was a Jew. Uh, why was he running from the Germans? Because he was a Jew. And I don't think that man understood what I was talking about. The shelter boy scout troop paraded with flags to show how American they were. High school principal Ralph Faust testified that the dozen refugee students had graduated with honors in just one year. They asked if I were permitted to uh, come into the United States legally, whether I would uh, present myself to the draft and subject myself to the draft, and I very proudly said, of course. The subcommittee that came to Fort Ontario voted unanimously to allow the refugees to remain in the United States. But a week later, the refugees' emotional roller coaster ride plunged downward when the full committee voted to let the State Department carry out the return to Europe. For the next six months, the refugees remained in limbo. One week brought hope, the next brought despair. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world World War II ended in August with the Japanese surrender. But the war within the government over the fate of the refugees continued. A great many people, both in Congress and in the State Department and Justice Department, were insisting that they be returned to Europe. Truman wasn't quite sure what to do for a while. It was a real embarrassment because here we were urging European countries to take in tens and hundreds of thousands of refugees, and we had a group of 1,000 here that uh, we really, uh, that, that we weren't releasing yet and didn't know what to do with. Europe was devastated. The Fort Ontario refugees had no homes to which they could return. And in the end, the multitudes of displaced persons in Europe simply made it impractical to send them back. It would have been preposterous for us to have sent a thousand back into that maelstrom of, of loose people, of rootless people. What would have happened, say, with the 40 to 60,000 in Switzerland? Should the Swiss have put them all back? The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. Three days before Christmas 1945, century, a year and a half after they arrived, the President Truman issued a directive that would lead the refugees to freedom. The immigration quarters would not be expanded, but the already existing quarters would be utilized, and the Oswego group would get first priority. He did that on December 22nd, which was after Congress adjourned, and he ordered that the machinery for bringing them in actually be put in place and well along before Congress got back. He wanted to be a fait accompli before Congress ever got back because there still was strong restriction of sentiment in the Congress. It was another liberation again. We went 
through the process of being liberated once more. It was that intense. It was a feeling of, oh, we made it, you know, we are here, we are alive, and we are free. I was home as a baby, and someone comes storming in, guess what? We can stay. And then, of course, we screamed, we yelled. You could hear the screams all around the camp. I mean, everybody screamed. We, were, we had to let go, you know. We were yelling and, and laughing and crying at the same time. We, we all were so happy. Because they had come into the country outside the immigration laws, the refugees had to leave the country in order to legally enter. Starting in January of 1946, they were bused past Niagara Falls into Canada, where they picked up a visa, turned around, and entered the United States as legal immigrants. We boarded the buses on our way to Canada, and there was a new sense of hope. There was a new a revitalization. The day had finally come to pass where we were going to be free. We were going to join that big melting pot out there. Actually, uh, my most anxious time started at that time, because then, you had to make a decision what to do, where to go. And all of a sudden, the, the fear that we had for so many years was right in front of us. You know, no money, no language. Where do we go and what do we do? The refugees went to various cities around the country to rejoin family and friends or strike out on their own. Today, more than 40 years later, most are very successful. They are lawyers and doctors, engineers and teachers. Many have made significant contributions to American society, from creating the CAT scan to creating a symphony. My dad was sent to a camp. Ralph Manfred is a chemical engineer. He was part of the team that developed many of America's missile systems, the Polaris, Minutemen, and Sidewinder. Fred Baum the camp translator, went to work for the United Nations in Europe after the war. Today, he imports shoes as president of Atlas Trading Company. Oh, Mr. Baus! Wie geht's? Oh, good, 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 like das ist good. Oh, so nice. Steffi Steinberg Winters still writes regularly to Ralph Fast and sees him every few years. She works in an import-export office as an administrative assistant. Leon Levitz founded the Department of Piano Technology at UCLA and has composed a variety of chamber music pieces and two symphonies. Come on, show off. Manya Breuer never had to endure another winter. She and Ernst moved to Los Angeles with Diane. They had two more children, but divorced in 1965. Manya, who had sung in many of the camp shows, went on to sing with several opera companies. Adam Munz held true to his testimony before the Congressional Committee and joined the Army 11 days after he was released from Fort Ontario. He is now the chief psychologist at the St. Luke's site of the St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital in New York City. Good to see you. <laughs> Many of the friendships formed at Fort Ontario remain strong today. Some of the former refugees have returned to Oswego several times. The barracks have all been torn down. Just a few of the other buildings still stand. The grounds are now a city park, but the altered landscape in the passing years have not dimmed their memories. What was, uh, you know, in our mind then, I think still is. You know, now we have to reorient ourselves. But uh, I know my barrack was over there. Where was yours? Right next, just across the kitchen, number 161, as you... Mine was 129. There you go. <laughs> There you go. It was a very momentous occurrence. It was not the kind of thing you forget. You don't forget being liberated from a camp. You don't forget uh, being liberated by the soldiers in Rome. You don't forget coming to Oswego. You don't forget leaving Oswego. While most of the former refugees have generally found memories of Fort Ontario, there is also sadness, guilt, and anger. Why me? Among six million, how come I was picked out to be a survivor and maybe others who 
might have been 10 times more talented than me or could have made a much better contribution, whatever. Why were they not saved? Why me? How many millions more, if we had rescued them, if they had survived, would have contributed to society in a meaningful way, whether as bricklayers or as doctors, whether as uh, train conductors uh, or professors, doesn't matter. But they could have become productive members of society. Instead, they're fertilizing fields somewhere. In 1991, a memorial marker was erected to honor the refugees at America's only shelter. It has since been vandalized twice, the corners have been chipped away, and the word Jewish has been carved out. I feel very strongly that that monument should remain as it is, as not only a memorial to the 982, but to the kind of situation that made us refugees, the kind of anti-Semitism that existed in the world that made us have to flee, that made us being expelled, and that made this place our haven. The former refugees are very much aware that they were a token group brought here for expedient, not humanitarian reasons. Oh, they are grateful for their lives and the opportunities that tokenism brought them. I mean, for them, Oswego is a triumph. It represents survival and life itself. But most have to look no further than their own families, grandparents, cousins, or uncles killed at Auschwitz or Treblinka, to know that Oswego also represents a failure of American policy. Fort Ontario should have been a model for safe havens on a grand scale, but it was not. Today, Oswego forces us to confront the painful questions of what might have been, what could have been, and what should have been. I'm Robert Clary. Good night. Welcome back. I'm Helen B. and Duty Hofer, host of Need to Know here on WXXI Television. Thank you for joining us for the 30th anniversary of the WXXI production, Safe Haven. I'm joined by three special guests at the table. Holocaust survivor, Helen Levinson, originally from Poland. Writer and producer of Safe Haven, Paul Lewis. And Holocaust survivor and former Safe Haven refugee, Irving Shield. Welcome, it is great to have all of you here. I appreciate it. Thank you. So Paul, this was a remarkable film and it touched upon every possible emotion that one could imagine, uh, from eye-opening and painful scenes uh, to even moments of humor that you were able to grasp. How did you want this film to be received by audiences when you originally set out to make it? Wow, it's 30 years ago. You want me to uh, go you back and- You can do it. I believe in you. Far back. <laughs> um, well, listen, it, it, number one, this is a story that nobody knew about. Somehow this is a little slice of American history and Jewish history that people just did not get. Nobody knew about this story. So that was my number one goal. Uh, number two, it was uh, mind shifting for me to understand how little FDR did for the Jews of Europe. Okay, so that was an important point to make. Yeah. Well, I wanna talk to both Irving and Helen because you visit classrooms and audiences all over the place, uh, and you have shared um, with these individuals your stories, your personal stories and your personal accounts. And I want to know, have the lessons from the Holocaust, the hatred, the anti-Semitism, have they been adequately taught in your opinion? And I'm asking this, and I'm looking at you, Irving, because I did read an article uh, where you said the lessons of our past have been disregarded by modern, the modern world. And I wanted to know, why do you think that that's happened? It's been, um, it's been 73 years uh, when it first happened, and the stories came true. A lot of people felt sorry, but people forgot. 
and uh, it's being lost. People don't remember. They don't know. Uh, the, the start of the Holocaust really started with uh, uh, with the um, Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass in Germany, in Berlin, where the brown shirt went around and broke all the windows of the stores and killed people. And uh, I asked an audience to raise their hand. How many of you know Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass? In 1939. And apparently, I had so few hands. Most people didn't know what it was all about. So, uh, so people forgot, and they're not interested anymore. I felt that it was not a very pleasant story, that people sort of shed, shied away from it because they felt that it, almost the whole world was to blame because some of them could have helped. They could have had the people that were under fire gotten them out, especially in the earlier times. But nobody did, very few did. And I didn't even know that there was a group that, was, that came here. I've never seen the, this camp. I had wished that my mother and father would have been there and my sister and brother, you know. But Lublin, where I was in, the Jews were finished off in 1942. So the Germans were in Poland right after the war, 1939, and it was getting worse all the time. And then suddenly people started to disappear. They surrounded the street, took out men, and they said they're going to work. It's just like the sign said over the concentration camp, and we had one right near where my father's brewery was, Arbeit macht frei, work makes free. And so everybody thought, well, we're just going to work. Nobody knew what was going to happen there. They kept it a secret. And uh, so that's the way the beginning was. We were not allowed to go to school. I was only in grammar school because I was still a little girl. And my father said to me, you know, you're going to grow up and you're going to be a dummy. And I sure did not want to be a dummy. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Helen, your story begins in Poland. Yeah. Irving, your story begins in Belgium. Both stories end here in the United States. And I want to hear about these stories. And Irving, I want to start with you. You were 13 years old when you arrived in Oswego uh, after Nazi persecution drove you from France to Italy. What were some, what are some of the most prominent memories, would you say, that, that come to mind when you think about those 18 months at the Fort Ontario shelter? My father, uh, first in Belgium, uh, anti-Semitism was rampant. I remember my father taking, walk, walking with my father, and he would point at people in the park where they were talking, and he was telling me about the kind of talking that was going on, which was anti-Semitism. And he knew in 1938 of Kristallnacht, and he decided that uh, what happened in Germany was going to happen in Belgium and in Brussels. So he decided we, we should go in France, because France is going to be uh, much safer for Jews. And apparently it wasn't. Uh, we, left, uh, we left Belgium as soon as the first bomb fell on Brussels. It was very difficult uh, getting, getting uh, a train ride to France. Somehow he managed to get us to France. And as soon as we got to France, uh, we had to report at the police station. And we got, uh, we had to have uh, documents, uh, some kind of a card, and that represents us. And immediately was stamped on it in big red letter, Jew. And the next day, they told us to uh, report at a train station. And um, we were, were brought into a kind of a concentration camp by the French. The French interned the Jews before the German even gave them orders. And I couldn't understand. I was nine years old. What did I do that I'm being interned, that I'm being put in prison? Uh, 
very shortly, while we were there, uh, it wasn't well run. Uh, food was terrible, uh, but my father was able to pay uh, some of the guards, and uh, they snuck us out of the plant, uh, snuck us out of the camp, and got us on a train to Marseille. And uh, we tried, we tried to come to the United States. The United States didn't go to war until 1942. This is 1940 now, and. Um, we went to uh, we went to the American embassy, tried to get uh, tried to get visas, and they gave us a piece of paper with a number on it. And my father said, "You know, by the time that number will come up, we'll be dead." He had already enough vision to realize that there was there's going to be a lot of problem, and um, and and it was very difficult. Uh, we eventually we went to a little town in Saint Martin de Vesuby, which was uh, a kind of a safe haven uh, because it was under the jurisdiction of Italians, Italian soldiers. And while we were there, we were safe. They couldn't take us until Hitler and Mussolini made the pact. And when that happened, the German took over, uh, when, took over the rest of France and uh, Jews had to escape. And, and if I can ask you, yeah. when, when you did arrive in Oswego, you were 13 years old at the time. Right. What, tell me about what that was like for you, that transition, that transition of life. We, uh, somehow, we managed to, uh, to, get to, uh, to get to Rome. And getting to Rome was quite, quite a trip. We were very, very lucky. Uh, at that time, I was hidden in a Catholic seminary. Thank God, thank God for, uh, for Christians that, uh, some Christian that really try to protect Jews. I was hidden, in, and my father was, had been taken by the Gestapo, and he was in, in a prison waiting to be deported to, a concentra to another concentration camp. The day that he was gonna be sent to a concentration camp, it was the day of liberation, and there we were in Rome. We were in Rome, and um, we had nothing. We lost everything. We had nothing. My father's an artist, and uh, we stayed in the Colosseum. And my father was able to draw the GIs, the, the Americans, the British, the Australians, for a dollar. So we had a couple of dollars to work with. And you heard through the grapevine there was that the United States is inviting Jews to come to America. And he applied. And there had to be a total family. It had to be a family that had been in a concentration camp, and total family, and nobody of military age. He applied for it. We got in. We're very lucky. About 3,000 people applied that were liberated from concentration camp from south of Rome. And uh, just getting on the Henry Gibbons on the boat and coming to America, because we had family in America. And I just have to ask one question, Paul, how were they selected? 3,000. Uh, it's very interesting that the, the, joint, the Joint Distribution uh, Committee was over there to try to make these selections. Part of, as Irving says, they were looking to, uh, repay, to, to bring over entire families, no one of military age. It was a very difficult uh, decision, as you saw in the film. You saw um, uh, his job was to make choices. He had written to his wife, he said that he was playing God and didn't like the role. Very difficult to do it. Interesting to note, though, that as much as this was a selection to bring people to the United States, it wasn't only out of a humanitarian instinct. The fact is that the refugees that had gathered throughout the southern part of Italy were clogging the roads and blocking the American and Allied soldiers from coming up from the boot of Italy as they were taking, retaking some land that way in the war. And because all these refugees were in the road, something had to be done. And then this idea for this one-time token refuge uh, came up, and so that, that clicked. And so, okay, we'll throw almost a 1,000 of them on this troop ship called the Henry Gibbons. Uh,
Helen, I want to tie you in. I want to ask you about this because you said, I, I spoke with your daughter prior to getting an opportunity to meet you, and she said that your father said to you uh, before he was killed, if you survive this, make sure this story is told. Make sure they know what happened here. This is something that you do every day when you visit schools and you visit with youth groups and community groups. And you told a group of young people that you made it because of a thousand miracles. That's how you survived. What were some of those miracles? Give me one of those miracles. Well, <coughs> I was very lucky that my father gave me a birth certificate that a priest gave him of a dead Catholic child. And her name was Christina Helena Chernyakovska. And when I had to say, actually they told my father that uh, from the brewery, uh, the uh, Germans who occupied the brewery, they wanted him until the last minute because the Germans loved his beer. Because my father had studied beer making also in Germany. And the, what he couldn't, he could not keep my father because Hitler made the order that everybody has to go. So he told my father, you and your family have to go to Maidane concentration camp. By that time, my father was not fooled anymore because I had been for a short time in Maidane. So he said, yes, of course we're going to go. But to us, he said, never. If they want to kill us, let them kill us with a bullet on the street. And I tried to hide. Well, we, t we uh, promised each other that we will not tell one another where we're going. Each one has to hide by themselves. And so I went to a good friend of my father's, who my father had helped all through the war. And he was there too. And that gentleman said, I'm sorry, two people I cannot help. One, maybe. So my father got up to go, and I said, no, Daddy, I'm going. I think I'm a little younger than you, and I can probably do things better than you. And so he didn't want to agree, but I really forced him to. He gave me some money, some zloty, which I, 300 of it I still have with me today. And um, he said to me, uh, blessed me, and he said, my dear child, if by any chance you should survive, and my survival was about this much, uh, please tell everybody what's going to happen. And then, when I was already, I, I, I had a very dear Catholic friend that was with me in grammar school, and she lived right kitty corner from the brewery that I was living in, and I was constantly there playing with her, and she was playing with me. I even helped her decorate the Christmas tree, and her mother loved me like her own daughter. She said, Helen, you will never survive if you stay in Poland. You have to go to Germany to work. And that's exactly what I did. She took me to the train station to buy the ticket for me to a small city near Lublin because she felt in Lublin somebody may recognize me and I was going to put myself up for work to Germany. And she was so wonderful. She walked ahead of me with a little suitcase that I had packed years before and I couldn't carry a suitcase because I would have been suspicious. She put it on the platform. I put myself right next to it. There was full of Gestapo on the platform. She went to buy the ticket for the train. As she passed me by, she just slipped the ticket into my hand and kept on walking. I couldn't say goodbye to her or even thank you. Yeah. I want to make sure that viewers know that when the war mm -hmm. ended, you had a family in Rochester, and you put, I read that you put ads in the paper to, to try to connect with your family, and eventually you were able to do so, and they were able to bring you here to, to Rochester when the war was over. Yes. Uh, Paul. In 1987, uh, this documentary received a Peabody Award, and juries, jurors congratulated the team, saying, this is a quote, for making a particularly timely statement about the undercurrent of racism and bigotry which afflict all governments. Uh, when you, 30 years later, and, and you look back at this film, and you look at the current state of our world, do you draw any parallels between where we were just what you covered in that film, what you were able to document versus where we are today. 
Sure, there are lots of parallels. Uh, it, it's the world has not learned a lot of lessons. Our inherent xenophobia, if you will. Uh, in, the, in the film, we talk about that babies were born in Oswego, but the government didn't know how to do them. All of this is resonant today with dreamers, etc. So there are lots of parallels. Uh, but frankly, the lesson of this whole experience at Fort Ontario is the what if. What if there had been more than a mere 982 brought over? All of these people made tremendous contributions. Look at, look at what Irving has done. Look at what all those others have done. What could have been if more had been brought over? Well, this has been an incredibly insightful and relevant and timely conversation. I want to thank all of you for being here today. To my guests, Paul Lewis, Helen Levinson, and Irving Shield. And a thank you to our viewers for joining us for the special 30th anniversary of the WXXI production, Safe Haven. I'm Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Have a good night.